It's never fun to do this type of video, where I come in and talk about a stock that I'm a little bit worried about, just a bit concerned about. I usually do videos, and the ones that I like doing are videos on the subject of stocks that I'm excited about, ones that I've done research on, that I look at the fundamentals, I look at the qualities of the company, I look at the, the charts and ratios, and I come to the conclusion that it's a great company that I wanna buy. And I highlight all the reasons I think the company is a really good company. If you followed me, you've probably seen many videos like that in the past. But every once in a while, I have to give an update on a stock that I'm a little bit concerned about. And that's the case here with Apple. Apple has moved into a category where I just, I, I just have a couple concerns, not huge ones, but just a couple concerns that I wanna share with you. And it's caused me to reduce my position again by around 14%. So I've done another slight trim to my position. Now I still own a lot of Apple, so I still have a stake in the company, but this is what it looks like right now. I currently have a total position size of 42,000 with 20,500 in the green. Now, in a lot of cases, whenever I trim any position, People are quick to say, Joseph, that's short term. This is all, you know, emotional. It's all quick judgments. That's not the case. I've owned Apple for over seven years. I've owned this company for a long period of time through thick and thin. I owned it all the way through 2020 and I bought more of it during that time period. So I've been a big investor of Apple. I've been a big advocate of it. And I've made a lot of videos about this company as well. Around two months ago, I made a video called I'm Trimming Apple Stock. That video was created December 14th. Since that time period, Apple is now down 14%, and the company that I bought with the proceeds of Apple that I showed in the video, I was trimming Apple to buy more Netflix. Well, Netflix is up around 20, I think 27% since that video. So it's not always a bad thing to trim a company if you use the proceeds to buy another company that does really well. In many cases, that can be a good trade. And that's what I'm hoping to do here with my trim on Apple. But I wanna go into the reasons that I become a little bit more concerned about Apple and their fundamentals. Let's go ahead and just go through a quick overview here. We have the whiteboard. So I've put this all down, listed it out, and I just wanna go through it one by one. These are just the things that I'm a bit concerned about at the moment. If we go into this, the first one is that Apple trades at a relatively high valuation of a 27 Ford PE. Now the fact that the company trades at a 27 Ford PE in and of itself is not really a concern. In fact, I hold a lot of companies that trade in the mid 20s or even into the 30 PE ratios. So the price to earnings ratio in and of itself is not the main factor here. The issue is, is that a company needs to justify their price to earnings ratio. And typically they justify that with pretty fast growth. So most of the companies in my portfolio are growing their earnings per share at a rate of 12% or more. In many cases, they're growing around 15 or 16% per year. For example, if we look at, we can bring up Texas Roadhouse here. If we type in Texas Roadhouse, we look at the PE ratio of the company. I'll zoom in here. It's at a 27, the exact same as Apple. So Apple and Texas Roadhouse, we can look here on Apple, 27 Ford PE. If we look at Texas Roadhouse, for example, we can look at the growth of the earnings. Last year, it grew earnings per share, 14%. And then for the past two years, 14% compounded growth. For the past five years, 15.6%. So it's growing in that 15 and 16% range, and that's pretty good for a company trading at a 27 Ford PE. Now, when it was trading at a 20 PE, that was even better, but I still believe that Texas Roadhouse justifies the valuation. It's at the same valuation as Apple currently, but it's growing around twice as fast. Apple's at a 27 Ford PE, but the company hasn't had any growth for the past three years. Just a tiny bit last year, 0.33%. And then the expectations of the future imply growth rates of around six to 7%. That's what it's expected to grow in 2024. So put another way, Texas Roadhouse and Apple are trading at the same multiple, but Texas Roadhouse is probably gonna grow at least twice as fast, maybe even three times as fast. So the problem isn't that Apple has a relatively high valuation. The issue is the expected growth in the company. And I believe the expectations are mostly correct. I think the company will grow around 7% in 2024. That level of growth for this multiple is a little bit slower than what I would like. Even companies that are more expensive, ones like Costco, 
they're going to grow a lot more than 7%. It'll grow 12% or more. And I like those companies that are growing in the double digits. Those are the majority of my portfolio. But again, the valuation concern is just part of this. It's really not my biggest concern about Apple. If it was purely just valuation, I wouldn't be trimming at all. The next thing is that there's a pile on happening by regulators. And this is something that I clearly see developing just more and more with Apple's story. The regulators have always been a problem for big tech, but the amount that they're concentrated and piling on Apple specifically is pretty crazy. In the EU, they just announced a fine of $2 billion. That's not incorrect, it's $2 billion. Now, this is the largest antitrust action that the EU has taken, and they've taken, of course, against Apple. Why have they taken this antitrust fine against Apple? Because Daniel Ek, the CEO of Spotify, has complained to the EU regulators 65 times, going to them over and over again, saying that Apple's being unfair. And because uh, Spotify is located in Sweden, it's a European company, the EU is working with Spotify to find Big Bad Apple. Now, you also have people in the US complaining as well. You have Tim Sweeney on Twitter constantly bashing Apple. Big Bad Apple. He can't sell his games on there without paying the Apple tax, right? Now, of course, Daniel Ek, the CEO of Spotify, and Tim Sweeney, the CEO of Epic Games, are both multi-billionaires that have unfathomable amounts of wealth, as well as they control massive companies in and of themselves. But against Apple, they're still viewed as the little guy, the little guy against Big Bad Apple. And this narrative has caused people to get behind this. They believe Apple's the bad guy here that should be punished for any regulations or anything where they make money in their app stores. Now, it hasn't ended here. We also have news that the EU is, of course, opening up. They're forcing Apple to open up their app store to where you can sideload apps. So Apple is bringing sideloading and alternative app stores to the iPhone. I've said repeatedly that part of my investment thesis for Apple is the ecosystem. The ecosystem is everything. As long as Apple can maintain and expand their ecosystem and the value proposition of it to customers, Apple will grow as a company. This is something that I see as a deterioration of the ecosystem. If they allowed sideloading with different apps and different app stores, different policies, different payment methods, and all of a sudden you have a cluttered mess of 10 different app stores like a Windows device, Apple loses its unique ability to have a streamlined app store with every single app in it. Now, you may say in the past that these numbers were a speeding ticket. That's what I heard a lot of the times when Apple would be fined $200 million or $300 million. But the number 2 billion, that's not a speeding ticket. That's not a tiny amount that Apple can just write off. It's not a rounding error. Last year, Apple made $100 billion in free cash flow. A $2 billion fine because of something this small, Spotify complaining about Apple, that represents 2% of their profits in a year, 2% of their total free cash flow in a year. That is a huge amount, even for Apple. And again, this is a pile on. It seems like it's gaining momentum. We're hearing about these type of fines more and more frequently and the impact that these new regulations have on their ecosystem. So this is something that, you know, in and of itself, again, these are just bits and pieces of news. But it, the, the problem is taking them all together. You have the $2 billion fine, you have them opening up their app store. It seems like Europe is driven to regulate Apple. And it seems like the US will be close behind to follow with these regulations. On top of that, you have this slower EPS growth this year, and you just layer on more of this news. This is the type of stuff I'm thinking about with Apple. Now, the next concern I have about Apple is a lawsuit, not against Apple, but a lawsuit against Google. The Department of Justice, the DOJ is suing Google. Now, to understand why this is a threat to Apple, even though the DOJ is suing Google, you have to know the entire premise and understand the lawsuit. The DOJ is suing Google for being a monopoly and profiting off of being a monopoly, specifically because of their default position on different devices. For example, if you buy a Windows device, if you buy an Apple device, if you buy a Samsung device, if you open up Firefox or, or Chrome or Safari, doesn't matter really what the browser is, Google search is going to show up. And Google has paid a lot of money to be defaulted everywhere. So the DOJ is saying, hey, look, Google, that's illegal. You're boxing out competition illegally by defaulting yourself everywhere. And Google pays a lot of money to be these defaults, of course. And one of the biggest places that they send money to to be defaulted is Apple. Apple has 2.2 billion installed active devices. And Google reportedly pays them 
$18 billion per year. We know these numbers, not just because of rumors, not just because of insiders, but because of lawsuits. These numbers have been revealed, so they're actually real. Google's paying Apple over $18 billion a year. This was a couple years ago, which means that the price tag has probably gone up as Apple has more devices, more active users. So the number's probably closer to like 20 or $22 billion a year. And again, Apple makes like $100 billion of free cash flow last year. So this is 20% of their entire free cash flow. Now the issue of course is if the DOJ prevails, Google wouldn't be the only loser. Apple would be a loser as well. Because if the DOJ prevails and they win the case, that would mean that the contracts that Apple have with Google are now invalid. Apple does have the, the option to go to a second bidder. Maybe they can go to Microsoft and put Bing on the front page, right? Um, Microsoft already wants to do that. But to get the same terms, to get the same amount of money, to have this be fully replaced is up in the air. And if the court struck it down, maybe Microsoft would be more inclined to make a different agreement, right? Maybe they wouldn't be as uh, inclined to give them the same amount of money. So this just puts something else up into the air. We already know that Apple has admitted in the court that they receive 36% of the revenue of any Google search on Safari browser. So Apple's making a fortune from Google. And if a judge disrupts this relationship, if they really come aggressively against Google and Apple, then that could impact Apple as much as Google. So Apple has another thing that I think is just, it's just one more thing that could impact the company overall. Now, finally, we get to another concern, and this one's a very small one. It's a minor one, but I, I decided to throw it in because it is something I think could impact Apple. Warren Buffett is a massive shareholder of Apple. He's really championed the company, and I believe that he does represent a little bit of key man risk in the story of Apple. For example, Last quarter, Berkshire sold 1% of its Apple stake. And because Berkshire sold 1%, you saw story after story after story of Buffett selling Apple, trying to make investors fearful. Now, the fact that he only sold 1% wasn't great. It wasn't positive news. He wasn't buying more Apple, um, but it wasn't the worst possible news. If we got news that Buffett trimmed his stake by 5 or 10%, what would that do to this stock? How would investors react to that type of news? This analyst argues that Buffett's already up a ton on his stake in Apple, which is true. He was buying the company in 2016. So he's made like five times his money on Apple already. It represents 50% of his equity portfolio. And what would happen if Buffett started to sell, which he could do because the valuation potential issues with it, Buffett could start to trim the holding a little bit more. He argues that the likely result, if Berkshire sells more shares, would be retail investors rushing for the exit and Apple shares getting slaughtered. Now, I think this would have an impact to some degree. You'd probably see like a same day sell off, but long term, Buffett selling or not selling is not going to determine Apple stock. Long term, the fundamentals will determine the company. So that's just a basic summary of some of my concerns about Apple. Now, do I think Apple is going to be destroyed and it's a huge value trap and it's going to go down? No, I don't. Otherwise, I would not own any of the stock and I still own $42,000 of it. So it's still a big position. But the reason that I'm trimming it a little bit, trimming it by 14%, is just because when I look at my holdings and different companies, I see more hurdles with Apple than other companies. For example, with Amazon, I don't see any of these challenges. They seem to have the regulation thing under control. They're growing in all of their core businesses above 10% per year, and they're growing their free cash flow. The story for Amazon, I think, is very clear. You know, it's a great story. The story for Visa and MasterCard are two companies that aren't facing really any big challenges. As far as I can tell, they're just doing business as usual. The same with Moody's and S&P Global. The same with Intuit, the same with Texas Roadhouse, the same with Costco. I see a lot of companies that are just cruising along and don't have quite as many hurdles to overcome as Apple. So even though I believe Apple can overcome them, I sure hope they can, I'm just a bit more nervous about the company than I am with other holdings. So I'm reducing the position a little bit. I'll be putting that money into other compounding machines. Maybe this will be a bad decision. Maybe Apple will rock it, but either way, it's what I feel best about right now. So that's my thoughts on the subject. Let me know what you think.